Hop and namaste, everyone. Christian Long, Life Enhancement Consultant, giving you a big and beautiful shout out on this transformation Q&A Thursday, where you come to get answers you can't find on Google. So before we begin, let us invoke. Place your hands on your heart. Be aware of your heart. Smile. Feel your heart expanding in all directions, past the nipples, the shoulders, further and further and further. So much love, so much happiness, so much expansion and gratitude. And beware of your crown, the entry point of spiritual energy from God, the great ones, the spiritual teacher, the higher self. And beware of the heart and the crown together, magnifying and amplifying one another's energy. Smile, feel the pillar of light, experience the pillar of light coming down. To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, respected and beloved teacher, Grandmaster Chou Kuksui. And without the teacher, it would be very difficult to understand these very high level spiritual principles and practices. To his teacher, Lord Bodhisattva Meiling, the Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, the Buddha of compassion and mercy, to Saraswati, the goddess of intelligence and wisdom, to Holy Master Count Saint Germain, the teacher of the violet flame, to all the holy gurus, holy masters, saints, archangels, holy angels, to the angels of inner and outer transformation, inner and outer healing, to our divine selves, or our higher souls, we humbly invoke for your divine light, love, and power for your help, guidance, and protection, for transformative healing energies. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. With gratitude, respect, and love, we thank you in full faith. So be it, so be it, and so it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So be it. <clears throat> so as, um, how should I put this? A way of grounding the energy when you're studying or learning things, you can also face north, right? So I'm looking east right now because I'm what? Being the facilitator. So the inner, so my upper chakras are more activated to share higher spiritual teachings with the group. And then as you're facing north, your ability is, can step down those energies. So usually when you're studying, you're learning uh, you're being productive, you want to face north. When you're doing spiritual practices, you want to face east. When you are doing um, computer work, computer projects, projects that deal with flexibility, you face west. And then when, well, that pretty much will cover it. We don't need to discuss the other things. Okay. You're very crackling, crackling, huh? Crackling. Let me try something. If I take it out, can you hear me now? A little bit? Teeny tiny? Okay. Hold on, everyone. Can you hear me now? Is that better or worse? Slightly better. Okay. Well, let's try this. If I get back in. Does it sound better or is it still crackly? Better, not better, worse. Can you hear me clear? Maybe if I, the volume's almost all the way up. Mm -hmm. Not sure what the crackliness is. Let me pause this for a second. All right there. Welcome back, everyone. Little technical difficulties with the sound. Um, so again, just to review for, in case it was crackly or hard to, hard to hear or the volume was too high. When you're studying, when you're learning something, you want to face north. When you're doing spiritual practices or healing, you want to face east. When you are 
doing things that require adaptability, flexibility, you want to face west. And then also when you're doing creative work, right? Painting, sculpting, writing, you want to face east. So this, this is covered in great detail in Spiritual Business Management. It's a class developed by Grandmaster Cho Kuksui many years ago. Very, very throat chakra class. That and Pranic Feng Shui are super, super throat chakra classes. Probably the most throat chakra would be advanced pranic healing because it requires a lot of nuanced practices to the technique. And then spiritual business management and pranic feng shui. They're very precise, right? Lots and lots of detail. So that's throat chakra. So let us get right into our questions. Um, first question. Uh, by the way, thank you for your questions. Excellent. I didn't include them all, but we have our 10 for, for today. And then we will have more in the following weeks. <clears throat> Tell us more about different ways to generate good karma, residual karma, immediate karma, etc. Okay, so this is taught in greater detail within the Kriya Shakti course. And you might be saying, Christian, you're trying to trick us into taking all the higher classes. Of course, there's no trick. There's no trick. Of course, I'm trying to convince you to take the higher classes, persuade you, nudge you, trick you, whatever it takes, get you in there, right? There's a there's a saying for pranic healing facilitators and pranic healing intro leaders and pranic healing instructors that our job is to get people to the door of the teacher. That's it. Get to the door of the teacher through a book, a meditation, a CD, a meditation night, a healing clinic, whatever it takes. Um, my particular commitment is to get people to, into our Hatha Yoga. That's always been my focus. So every time I do healing on someone, lead a meditation, teach a class in some way, shape, or form. It's always to nudge people to, hey, if you take basic pranic healing, advanced pranic healing, and pranic psychotherapy, there's this super advanced spiritual school known as our Hatha Yoga. So I always try to push people in that direction because I got involved with pranic healing because of our Hatha Yoga. I didn't want to become a healer. <laughs> Joke's on me. I didn't want to become a healer. But when I heard about, hey, there's spiritual practices to develop the golden body. What's the golden body? Hey, there's spiritual practices to rapidly, properly, and safely evolve yourself and merge with the higher soul. What does that even mean? And what's the higher soul? So I had had a regular spiritual practice for about four years, about four, four and a half years before finding out about Arhatic yoga. But as soon as I heard the word Arhatic, I said, that is very familiar. That's very familiar. And I wanted whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And I was able to materialize myself and my wife for the class, buying the plane ticket, registering for the class, the hotel room, the rent a car, everything like that. Pretty miraculous. I was like, we don't have enough money to buy food this week, but somehow we materialized several thousand dollars to go to a spiritual retreat course. So whenever people tell me, and again, I have to be careful of my audience, but whenever people say, yes, I want to grow. Yes, I want to evolve. Yes, I want to be of service to humanity. Yes, I want to have a stronger connection with my higher self. We say, okay, there's these classes and then this major class that will help you with that. And they go, uh, well, how much is it? That's a few hundred dollars. Eh. Right then I'm like, the will's not there. They, don't, they lack understanding of what the priceless teachings they're getting are, and then they lack the will to make it happen. There have been many times that I've slept in airports. I've crashed with strangers. I've done anything and everything it takes to get another nugget, another piece of wisdom, another healing, another insight, another opportunity to be around one of the masters or healers, senior practitioners. So it doesn't matter to me. So when people say, oh, it's too much money. I'm like, you don't have understanding and you lack the will to make it happen, right? Which isn't their fault, but all you can do is just keep pointing the way and being a good example. That's it. So if people look at you and they go, wow, that person has their life together. They have their relationships together. They have their finances together. They have their ability to think. They're, they seem to be compassionate. They seem to be loving. Hmm, I want whatever that person has. And then that person's job is to go, well, this is where I got it from. This is who I learned it from. This is what I've been practicing, right? You have to be a product of the product. 
But if you're aggressive, if you're angry all the time, if you're stressed out all the time, if you're posting things, and I've talked to clients about this in the past, if you're posting things on Facebook, showing how horrible life is going for you, you're not being an embodiment of the teachings you've been given, the healings you've been given, the techniques, techniques that you've been given. And then what are people doing on social media, merging to that energy, right? So if you're, if you are, what is it called? Airing your dirty laundry on social media, everyone's attaching to that. They're energizing that in your system and it's making your life more difficult, right? So it's not about, um, it's not about ignoring things, but it's about letting the people know that need to know that can help you, that can move you forward, right? Um, which is super, super important. But to go onto social media looking for pity and looking for um, to release some grievances that you have, not recommended. Not recommended. It's not good for your energy body. It's not good for your growth and development. So when I see clients do that because they've hired me and they've given me permission to give them feedback, I you know, say, hey, I saw this post and this post and I'm noticing a pattern of your post. I explain to them what's happening energetically and I say, probably best to remove those posts. And nine times out of 10, they do for their benefit. So different ways of generating good karma. So that's taught in the Kriya Shakti class. And karma is linear. So what do I mean by that? One plus one equals two, right? So whatever it is that you want in life, that's what you have to plant. It's super easy. Whatever it is that you want in life, you have to plant, right? So if you want money, material prosperity, you have to plant money into the physical world because you're getting something physical in return, right? Very simple. That simple principle people miss most of the time. Most people that come and say, hey, I would like help with prosperity. I first question I ask them is, are you tithing? And they're like, what's tithing? I go, are you giving money to those in need? Uh, yeah, I give money occasionally to homeless people. Well, how much? I don't know, $5. How often is that? Every few months? Okay, that's not enough. Right? So it's the amount, it's the duration, it's the expectation, it's the karma that you have to pay off to begin with. Like there's all these many, many different factors. But simply put, whatever it is you want, you have to give, right? So um, people that are looking for relationships, looking for the right partner to build a life with, are you the right partner to build a life with? I want someone who is compassionate, patient, tolerant, understanding, loving, good in bed, all of these things, right? And you ask yourself the question, are you those things? Have you been planting those seeds in your relationships Hopefully you're not planting that those seeds with multiple partners, but have you been planting those seeds? Um, and then that's what you'll get in return, right? So if you plant infidelity, you re you receive infidelity. If you plant um, aggression, you receive regression. If you plant emotional unavailability, which that's a common experience I've noticed with many of my clients are women and many of them are looking to find the right partner. And I ask them the question, are you emotionally open? Are you emotionally available? And it like a light bulb goes off in their head and they're like, well, no, I'm not. And I go and look at the partners you keep attracting into your life, emotionally unavailable partners, right? So whatever it is that you want, you have to plant. You, you have seeds in your hands that you need to let go of. But people have the wrong understanding and the wrong viewpoint as they go, well, wait a minute, I'm supposed to, I'm afraid that I'm planting the wrong seeds or I'm planting at the wrong time or I'm planting with the wrong person. It's like, that's not how it works. True, there are higher teachings and principles at play, but the main principle is it is in the giving that we receive, right? So people, I had a client a few months ago, she finally got it, big aha for her who was having a lots and lots of difficulty showing love to her new husband and showing love to her family. Her like, what is it called? A merged family, I guess would be the term. And, um, and I said, what are you? She goes, well, I guess I'm the soul, right? That's what you've been teaching. And I go, yeah, you're the soul, right? Which is what? A being of light, a being of love and a being of power. So your essential nature is love, which means what? To provide, to protect and to preserve. 
have you been loving in your relationship? No. I said, why? Because I don't want to be taken advantage of, because I don't want to be hurt, because I don't want to be let down. And I said, has that, has that um, practice been working? What's your feedback of living like that? Well, I, I feel really empty. I feel hollow. I feel unfulfilled. I said, exactly. Because you have the seeds within you that you're not releasing. You're not releasing the seeds of loving kindness and not injury. You're not releasing the seeds of compassion and mercy. You're not releasing the seeds of goodness and sweetness and tenderness and intimacy. So how can you expect to reap that harvest in your life, right? Also, people who have a lot of um, anger and aggression issues, what have they been doing? Being aggressive and angry towards many, many people in their lives. And the karma comes back to them as that. So they lack inner peace. So people who are very angry have no inner peace. So again, the karma is linear. You plant corn, you get corn. And it's exponential in what comes back to you. You don't plant one bit of wheat and only get one bit of wheat back. You get 120 bits of wheat back, right? So when you plant love into the aura of another person, a huge amount of love comes back to you. When you plant prosperity, it's not you invest a dollar into the inner world and a dollar comes back. It's you invest a dollar and $10 or more comes back. It's the law. It's how it works. And you go, well, I don't believe it. It's like, okay, then don't believe it, right? You have the choice. You have the free will not to believe. But look at what your results are and the results are the fruit and then go, okay, well, the fruit that I've been receiving, I don't like very much. What would I like to receive instead? Aha, then I have to plant different, I have to plant different seeds, right? So the person is asking about residual karma and immediate karma. This is a little bit too detailed for this particular mm, venue because this is taught in the higher levels within Kriya Shakti, but in essence, to keep it nice and simple, whatever it is that you need, want, and require, you give that, right? And then to accelerate what comes back to you is you decree it, which you basically say, the money I'm giving, I want it to come back to me in the form of this, right? So I want prosperity. I, want, I plant money and I want this to come back to me in the form of prosperity. I plant money and I want this to come back to me in the form of physical health. I plant money. I want this to come back to me, right, in whatever form. So you can do that with your tithing and you do that with serving your service, right? So you do three hours a week of helping out with the homeless, the feeding program, soup kitchen, Habitat for Humanity, Domestic Abuse Center, a suicide hotline, right? You dedicate your time and then you can decree that time to come back to you in the form of whatever it is that you are seeking, right? And then you might say, well, can I decree some of my good karma or some of my tithe to someone else? Yes, but it is more powerful if it's from their account, right? So I could tithe $10,000 of my money and decree it to go to someone, right? Physical healing, relationship healing, whatever, right? Whatever we want to decree it towards. Or that person could take $10,000 out of their own account and tithe it to somewhere else. It's more powerful if they do it from their account because the karma, that money, is energy that's connected to them. It does have a positive effect if somebody else does it with their own money, but it's more powerful if the person who needs the energy or needs the good karma uses their money, right? So again, I don't wanna to go too off the rails with this because there's a, the more that's explained, it'll open up more questions, which is taught in the higher class, which I'm not authorized to teach to the public slash semi-public forums. Um, next question. If one raises money for a specific cause, what kind of karma is one generated immediately as well as every time someone that person asks for donation, make a donation and refers that cause to someone else? If one raises money for a specific cause, what kind of karma is one? Um, so again, whatever you give, 
that comes back to you in like form. You want money, you give money. You want friendship, you be a friend. You want happiness, make others happy. You want understanding, help other people understand. You want higher spiritual teachings, inspire other people to practice, learn and practice higher spiritual teachings, right? Um, and again, this is connected to the donation. So it's better for the person to donate for themselves than for someone else to donate for them. For children, you can donate for them, right? For children, you can donate for them because they, they don't have access to material resources yet. But again, karma is linear. Look at your life, look at your fruit, and that'll tell you what seeds you've been planting. And then you say, okay, great. I don't want these seeds anymore. I don't like watermelon. I'm gonna stop planting watermelon seeds. Got it. Then the next question is, what seeds do I want to plant moving forward? Right? So that requires awareness and understanding. So if you're like, okay, money is good, but relationships are not so good right now. Okay, what seeds, what fruit am I experiencing my relationships? Okay, uh, jealousy, enviousness, lack of trust. Okay, great. So it means I have to practice forgiveness. That means I have to practice gratitude. That means I need to practice um, good self-esteem and good self-worth. It means I have to practice trusting in myself and trusting in God. Aha. So then those are the seeds that you start planting. And then guess what? The dynamic between you and your partner will change. Either you'll come closer together and harmonize, or you'll go further apart because the karma that brought you together is now neutralized. There's nothing else to learn with one another in this incarnation. They move on, you move on. And then the next person you attract into your life, ta-da, will be a materialization of the seeds of good self-esteem, um, forgiveness, and trust. Okay? So... Yeah, it's it's so it's so fascinating because if you guys remember from the Wesak festival, you know the the three C's is you have the, the law the law of change, law of cycle, which we can't affect either one of those, and then we have the law of karma, which is a K. I understand <laughs> the cuz the three cuz or consequence, right? Cycle, change, and consequence, or the law of karma. That's the only thing that we have control over. So that's by tithing, by service, and learning our lessons. That's how you improve the quality of your life. Not by blaming others, not by pointing fingers, not by forcing the world to be as you wish it to be, but changing your inner world, and then that will materialize into the outer world. Next question. Is it beneficial to have a plant or flowers in a meditation room? Yes, absolutely. The beings of beauty are connected to plants and flowers, the beings of beauty. If so, what kind and how long do plants and flowers hold the meditation energy? So for full moons within pranic healing and arhatic yoga within full moon meditations, there's typically flowers. Within every arhatic yoga retreat, there's typically flowers. Um, and usually the higher classes, there's flowers that are blessed or consecrated throughout the weekend or throughout the class period, meaning the divine energies are being absorbed into the flowers. And so when you take those flowers home, right, because they give them out as a donation to the disciples, when you take that home, it's like taking a part of the retreat home with you, and then you can wrap it up in silk or you can put it off somewhere to the side and it will hold on to that divine energy for years and years and years and years, years and years and years. Um, I remember many years ago in Sarasota, this might've been in 2005. My first Wesak was in 2004. Yep. My first Wesak was 2004. So my second Wesak of 2005, um, a friend of mine, who is a pranic healer. I think she was about to learn her Hatha yoga, but she'd been a, prung, uh, a, feng, a feng shui expert for many, many years, been in esoteric study groups and metaphysical groups for many, many years. 
And um, she invited me over to her place and she goes, check this out. And I go, what? And she goes, what do you think of these roses right here? I'm like, they're beautiful. They're radiant. I was like, did you just get them? She goes, no, I've had them for a month. I'm like, you've had them for a month. There's no way. How could you have those flowers look like that? And you've had them for months. She goes, oh, these were, these were flowers that I brought to our little Wessack that we did. And then they got blessed and consecrated. And I go, but they look like they were just cut yesterday. So it depends on who's blessing the flowers. You know how in the Christian faith and the Catholic faith, they have the Eucharist, right? Blessing the bread. How much spiritual energy and how much concretization of that spiritual energy is in the Eucharist is dependent upon the person blessing the Eucharist. So if the person blessing the Eucharist has a gigantic crown chakra with a huge spiritual cord, they implant a lot of divine energy into that. So then when the person eats the bread, they're, they're, it's called Eucharist healing. They get cleansed and purified super, super fast. But if the priest has a small cord and a small crown, the amount of divine energy is going to be greatly limited or reduced. So the effect may not be so bad, may not be so intense. Funny enough, if the person receiving the Eucharist has a bigger crown and spiritual cord than the person blessing the Eucharist, they can actually become contaminated. Weird, right? You're like, I'm, I'm here to receive. <laughs> Here's your congestion. Have a nice day. Okay. So, um, so the flowers will hold on to the divine energy for years. You can wrap it in silk to protect the energy more, but the radiant quality is not going to be there. Do you understand, right? So the flowers are at the retreat. The flowers have been consecrated. The flowers radiate a tremendous amount of energy. You take the flowers home. They're continuing to radiate energy, but then you wrap them in silk. The radiation is now contained within the silk. Silk is shielding. So you don't want to really wrap your, your blessed items. If you want to protect them, you can. And then maybe you do them for certain spiritual practices like WESAC, certain retreats. Um, you can also bring them to get recharged, right? So people take their, at retreats and special events, they take their healing crystals to them, right? And they get them cleansed and charged up. It's super interesting. One of the masters, he's extremely sensitive. And, uh, and I handed him a crystal because I wanted him to consecrate the crystal. And he was... He was about to consecrate and he goes, and he was like, you, he goes, you didn't clean the crystal. You don't get something consecrated if it's not clean, right? So you have to cleanse it thoroughly, remove any and all programs. So you cleanse it, you cleanse it physically, right? Make sure it's physically clean. And then you cleanse it energetically. And then you remove any and all programs, thought forms, entities, elementals that could be connected to that crystal then you can have it consecrated and programmed, which is taught in pranic crystal healing, which there's also a book connected to that as well. Good question. Um, next question. What should one have and not have in a meditation room? Anything and everything that invokes a negative response, remove. Anything that invokes a negative response, if you had a falling out with a spiritual teacher and that spiritual teacher is on your altar, remove the picture. If um, someone, if someone gave you some artifact that you have on your altar and that person, you had a falling out with that person or you had a, that person died and you have regret and you have shame and you have guilt, remove the artifact because it's, your viewpoint has changed. And so the energy is being changed of that thing. So the things that in your, the things that are in your altar, you want them to do what uplift you. You want them to elevate your consciousness. You want them to make you experience oneness with God and oneness with all. But if you're looking at something that drops your energy, that brings up negative thoughts, negative feelings, negative memories, it's going to be anchoring you to the lower planes. So you can't go as high. 
So what are some things you can have in your altar? Flowers, fresh flowers, beautiful energy, vib vibrant energy, the beings of beauty. If you have a picture of your spiritual teacher, you can have a picture of guides or mentors, right? You can have, um, it's always good to have some um, a, a figurine of Lord Ganesha, the remover of obstacles, right? Because when we do our spiritual practice, we have resistance, we have laziness, we have distractions, we have things that get in our way. So being aware of Lord Ganesha's energy removes those obstacles, right? Um, you can burn incense on your altar, which cleanses and purifies it. You can burn sage, cleanses and purifies. You can um, burn frankincense, cleanses and purifies, right? Um, some people have super, super advanced altars and some people have minimal altars. It really depends on your personal preference. Also, when you're kneeling or sitting at your altar, all the teachers have to be above your crown. Meaning you can't have an altar that's at your level. So if you're sitting down in every little nook and cranny and um, knickknack or teacher or artifact, is at your eye level or lower, the energy is not there. It has to be above you, right? It has to be above you. Um, what else? Yeah, so it depends on your faith. You may or may not resonate with your faith. So if you resonate with your faith, if you have good experiences with your faith, right? Then you would, you would put pictures that would invoke connections like, if you're of the Christian faith, then it would be certain archangels. If you're of the Hindu faith, then it would be certain gods or deities, right? But at the end of the day, those are all portals. Those are all form to the formless. That's what it means of having an idol. The idol is to ground energy and to give you a focal point for your devotion. But then as you grow and you develop as a soul, you need less and less and less and less and less form, less and less and less and less things to put your focus on because you're going into the higher world. I, I might've uh, might shared this in a group several months ago, but my ex-wife came from a Baptist family where she grew up in Florida. And obviously she meets a yogi, a young yogi, an immature yogi, <laughs> A completely all over the map yogi and she goes ah, I don't know but I mean okay he's not Christian even though his name is Christian you know um, he, he's into I don't know spiritual things yoga things um, Hinduism uh, Buddhism I, he's kind of all over the map because Master Chola was eclectic but her and I learned pranic killing at the same time and so as her and I were taking the pranic healing classes together month after month, and we started practicing, we started doing healings on each other. We started getting feedback from other people that we were doing healings on. We had a little altar in our apartment and she had a, she had a picture of Lord Jesus, that only Lord Jesus on the altar. And I go, Oh yeah. I mean, I respect obviously Lord Jesus, great, great teacher. It was an avatar, right? And, um, and then I, I, and then I noticed one day I came home, it was, a, it was the strangest thing. It was a very profound experience in our relationship and our dynamic together. And I came home one day and instead of seeing a picture of Lord Jesus in the center, I saw a picture of Lord Jesus off to the left and then a picture of Master Choa off to the right. And I was like, huh. What happened? And she goes, because I realize, she goes, I realize that Master Chola is a great teacher. And I was like, <sighs> and I'm throwing this out there for you guys. Atma Namaste Avani. I'm throwing this out for you guys. The connection between Master Chola and Lord Jesus is closer than you realize. If you study pranic healing and you study our hatha yoga and you study the deeper teachings of Christianity, you will start making some connections. Don't take my word for it. 
practice discernment, practice understanding. So whenever people from the Christian faith, wink, wink, ask me questions about pranic healing or hot yoga and does it, um, does it coincide with Christianity more than you realize? Remember, the great teachers are beyond religion. Also remember, don't look at the finger, look at where the finger is pointing. Words are fingers, principles are fingers, right? They're pointing at something. When you say God, what does that mean? When you say the higher soul, what does that mean? Because some people go higher soul, incarnated soul, divine spark, over soul, spirit, Holy Spirit. What does all that mean? People get lost in the language, but they don't know where it's actually pointing to. So always look at where the finger is pointing, not just at um, the finger itself. Because guess what? A finger can be used to point at many things. That's why you have levels of truth. So look at where the finger is pointing, and then that will be your guide, not the finger. Okay. Next question. During meditation, I'm about to let go and then immediately the mental body resists. Why is that lack of purification? Good question, right? So you're sitting still, you're being aware. And then all of a sudden you start experiencing yourself expanding. And then you expand and you expand and you expand and then you hit like an upper limit. You're like, well, why can't I go further? Why can't I, what's happening? Lack of purification. Lack of purification, which goes back to what? Physical purification, etheric purification, physical pur or emotional purification, mental purification, spiritual purification. That is what's inhibiting you from experiencing who and what you truly are is your lack of purification. So the person who meditates every single day for a year has purified, 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 purified. So they have a greater glimpse of who and what they are versus the person who meditates once per year, right? So yes, it's lack of purification. Um, when people are overly mental, it's hard for them to let go. One of my mentors says you can exhaust the mental body and then the mental body will let go. So typically people who are very, very tired, who can't fight, who can't struggle, who can't challenge themselves anymore, have a tendency that when they start meditating, they let go. So you also have inner resistance. So you can have mental resistance where you're questioning, 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 questioning. So when someone says, let go, you're like, let go of what? <laughs> What am I letting go of? Then you start playing a mental game and then you stay what on the mental plane? Or emotionally, you know why people have a hard time letting it go emotionally, which is connected to the solar plexus? Fear. What's out there? If I let go, what am, what am I going to experience? If I let go, can I come back? So that's another reason why people can't let go is because of fear. So have you ever had a dream and you dream like you're falling or you dream like you're drowning and right before you're about to die, you <gasps> come back into your body? That's what happens when people are afraid in meditation. So they're still, right? They're physically still. Their body is still. Their emotions are calm. Their mind is still. And then what starts happening? You start leaving, right? You start leaving and leaving and leaving. It feels like you're floating, hovering above your body and then beyond, and then <gasps> you come back into your body because there's a cord in your liver connecting you to your astral body. But because we lack emotional mastery, which is connected to purity, we're like, ah, you get scared and then you have to come back. But if you just go, everything's fine, it's okay. I've been here before, you can just go right? Every single night you go to bed, you die every night. 
every single night, your consciousness shifts into your astral body and you travel in the astral world, right? And the cord connecting your astral body to your liver is what keeps you integrated into your physical body, right? If, if there was a way to cut that cord, you wouldn't come back, but you can't cut the cord. So just like in meditation, you're like, what if I get lost? What if I can't come back to my body? It's not true. You have a cord connecting you, connecting you. You have several cords connecting you. So it's okay. Leave. That's why when we say in meditation, let go. There's nothing to hold on to. Let go. Let go, let go, let go. There are our entire books written about letting go. Which is which isn't that fascinating? Look at Eckhart Tolle. What is his teachings? Be here now, presence of now, power of now. That's it. But he wrote three books, retreats, a global movement for the past 25 years on what? That one principle. Abba Namaste, Chrissy. That one principle. Amazing, right? You're like, I don't understand. How can he take one principle of the power of now, the present moment, and create all this because it's so deep and it's so vast and it's so misunderstood, right? So yes, the reason you have a hard time going higher up is because of lack of purification. The other reason is you have lack of understanding. You're merging with the emotional plane, fear. You're merging with the mental plane, excessive thinking. You're merging with the physical body, right? How many people meditate and they're like this? You're not going to have stillness. You guys realize that in order for you to access the higher soul in the beginning, right? Keep in mind, truth is dynamic. Truth is paradoxical. But in the beginning, you need to become very good at being still. You know, those guys that like, like freeze frame and they don't move for like an hour. That's how you have to be when you're meditating. Because when you're like this, the emotions start becoming activated. You become frustrated and irritated. Like, when do I get to move again? If you're like this, right? You're meditating. You're like, okay, my physical body is still. And then your emotions start getting worked up. You get frustrated. You get impatient. What is that? Lack of purification. You have not purified anger, frustration, irritability from your lower chakras. But as you continue to practice what? Stillness, you become purified. Oh, my solar plexus is actually released a lot right now. Okay, now I can just be emotionally still, emotionally calm. Then you go into the mind. You start thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, you're like, God, I wish my mind would just shut up for five minutes and just give me some inner peace. All right, well, whatever. I'm just gonna observe my thoughts, okay. La, 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 la. What are my thoughts? Okay. I have to call this person. How many more minutes do I have to do this? When's Christian going to stop talking? Okay. Got it. Uh huh. So you're thinking, 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 right? The mind is running. The mind is racing, but then there's going to come a point that you're like, I just don't care. Whatever mind. I'm not the mind. I'm the soul. Keep, keep chatting away. And then guess what? The mind starts clearing out. It starts cleansing and purifying. It becomes brighter and brighter and brighter right? And then you have access to the higher soul. But it's a process that you have to be patient with. So yes, purification, practice, practice, practice. Next question. When I'm healing, sometimes I feel like falling asleep. What is happening and how can I prevent it? Same thing with meditation. Because when you're healing, you're being what? A channel of anyone, anyone? a channel or an instrument of goodwill and the will to do good. So when you invoke, Lord, make me an instrument of healing energy for this person to heal them, to transform them, to move their lives forward, the, the spiritual cord begets, becomes bigger, right? The crown becomes bigger. All the chakras become bigger. Energy comes down and you start healing the person. Why do you, why do you get tired in that process? Because there's many factors. One, you can be congested. You could be congested. So you're congested. You just invoke like, because your aura is already full. 
your aura is already full and congested. So then you introduce fresh energy from the soul into a congested energy body and it kind of like shuts down your system. So that's one factor. So you could be congested before the healing. Number two, the person connects to you and they siphon off a tremendous amount of energy super fast. So you could be merging, merging your energy with the person consciously doing it, right? You're like, this person is depressed. And then you merge your consciousness with their depression, which drops your energy considerably, meaning you're not staying connected to the higher soul, right? Because when you're, ex when you're connected, what does that mean? Expansion, right? I'm connected to my higher soul. I am that I am. I'm one with God. I'm one with all. What does that do? It expands your energy. So that you're like, okay, this person is depressed. This person is depleted of prana of energy, but we have enough because I am that I am. But if you start meditating on the depression, on the sadness, on the loneliness, on the low energy, you start becoming one with that person. So sometimes we forget. We think we're the other person's depression. We think we are the tiredness. We think we are the depression, right? Versus I am that I am. As soon as you do that, you become awake. Energy expands, okay? The person could be plugging into the spleen, right? When people need prana, they plug into the spleen. So psychotherapists, doctors, nurses, any person or persons who's worked with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis in general, right? Connect to the spleen and pull energy. If you're a teacher, they connect to the throat and the spleen in the sex, especially if you're attracted to the teacher, connection to the sex, which can make you depleted. So it's a combination of you could be getting congested, which is making you shut down. You could be merging your energy with the person's lower energies, which is cutting you off from the I am, from the higher self. Um, you could also be getting super depleted from the person that you're working on, right? So it depends. I'd have to see the actual situation of what's happening. I have a feeling in this particular case, the person is, is forgetting that I am that I am. Also, this is super important. Remember we talk about you have concentration and you have awareness and you need both of them to function in the inner world. So when you're doing healing on people, you can't be leaving your body in general. Remember levels of truth, truth is paradoxical. You can't be leaving your body. So you have a protocol. Somebody comes in with a migraine headache. You get out the pranic healing advance book. Okay, pranic healing protocol for migraine headache. And you go step one, step two, step three, step four. But if you're out of your body and you're like, I'm so blissed out, man, this is amazing. And you're not even doing the protocol. The person's not getting the benefit of the protocol. So you have to practice some concentration of step one, step two, step three, with also having awareness of what? The I am. So you're doing two things that are contradictory to one another simultaneously. You're practicing awareness of what's going on with the person's energy body. Who am I? What am I merging to? What am I connecting to? And concentrating on the protocol. Step one, step two, step three. Okay, I clean the chakra. I, I cleanse 50 times. Now I have to energize for three breathing cycles. Okay, wait a minute. How much did I clean for that one? Nuts. I wasn't concentrating. I was fluffing off in the inner world. All right, let's get, let's get, let's get it together. Then you start cleaning again, 50 times, then energize three breathing cycles. What's the next chakra? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? So you have to have awareness and concentration simultaneously. That's why master Chola says pranic healing is meditation in motion to an outside observer. It just looks like this, right? But to a clairvoyant or to the person who knows what they're doing, it's much different, right? So meditation and motion, you're practicing concentration and awareness simultaneously when you're doing a healing on someone. It's not all awareness because then you're not there. You're doing no protocol. You're just, woo, I'm off on the I am and I'm merging with their I am. And this is amazing. Or you could go, I'm completely focusing on the protocol 
step one, step two, step three, concentration, but you have no awareness of the higher self and you have no awareness of what the, there's no sensitivity. What's that called? Bedside manner, right? You have a doctor that goes, all right, what's the chart? Okay, this, this, and this. And there's no sweetness. There's no softness. There's no consideration. Just a doctor showing a level of affection and compassion can heal in and of itself, right? So you have to have awareness or concentration and awareness when you're doing healings. So those are some reasons as to why this person might be taking a nap when they do their healings. Um, regarding character building, I heard something about working on a specific virtue, one virtue at a time. Yes, for a certain amount of time to master it before you focus on another virtue. Yes, can you elaborate on what to do and why? Partly I can, okay? So within pranic healing, at the end of the basic class, we go over the five major virtues, right? The five major virtues, loving kindness, not injury, generosity and non-stealing, accurate perception, correct expression, and honesty and non-lying, constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness, and moderation and non-excessiveness, right? Those are the five virtues that we work on within pranic healing. Um, it's recommended to work on a virtue for two to three months. If you go into the pranic psychotherapy book, if you've not taken our hatha yoga, you go into the pranic psychotherapy book and it gives you the whiteboard technique. And that's how you spend 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes in the evening of looking at that virtue, right? In essence, you're going, okay, today's this time period I'm working on loving kindness and on injury. Okay, well, where was I not being loving and kind? Where was I causing injury? Okay, I was, I yelled at somebody on the, on the road. I um, cut somebody in line at the Starbucks. I became really frustrated and impatient with somebody at the grocery store and I yelled at my kids. Okay, so those were all the moments that you were being injurious and you weren't practicing loving kindness. So then you disintegrated on the whiteboard. You cut the cords between you and the board, right? This is in the book, right? So I'm not covering that right now. And then you look and go, okay, moving forward, what are the loving and kind thoughts, words, and actions in that specific situation? What could I have done differently? Because without awareness, there's no inner transformation, right? No awareness, no inner transformation. So you go, okay, I'm loving and kind here because <clears throat> that's how you develop a virtue. You have to be aware that you're, that you even know, you have to be aware that you're not practicing the virtue. And then you have to be aware of how to practice the virtue. And then you have to practice, practice, practice. And then at some point in time, your consciousness will shift to such a degree that the old you is dead and gone. That's called creative destruction. Lord Shiva, the creative destroyer and restorer. So our liver replaces itself, our entire body, our cells replace it. All of our cells are replaced every seven years. I think our liver is like six months. Every cell in our liver is replaced every six months. But why does our body still look about the same? If everything's replaced, why do we still look about the same? Because our etheric body is what's holding everything together. So if you can change the blueprint of your etheric body, you can change your physical body. If you want greater longevity, and youthfulness and vitality change the etheric body. Okay. So character building, I'll say it once, I'll say it twice, and I'll say it three times a lady. You have to be super diligent with character building. It is the foundation for your personal, professional, and spiritual life. No character development, no development. You will fall because of your vices. No question. No doubt. 100%. If you have anger issues, you better take care of them. If you have self delusion, you better take care of it. If you have impatience, you better take care of it. If you have fear, you better take care of it. Period. It will be your downfall. Guarantee it. Self delusion is one of the hardest ones because we can't see it. Usually it requires other people to give us feedback. 
Hey, you're being delusional. Hey, you're lying to yourself. Hey, you're not seeing that situation clearly. That's one of the most dangerous ones. That's why pride cometh before the fall. That's why pride is the last vice to go. A saint can fall due to pride. A holy master has mastered humility. A holy master no longer has pride. So if a saint, a high level saint can fall due to pride, how much more for us unaware people who have not, right? Who have not worked on negative pride. Negative pride is something, this is just for you guys. I would recommend working on every single day. Rain, sleet, or shine. Because it is so ingrained in our consciousness, our being, the human condition, the collective energy of humanity. It's just everywhere. And that's why the hardest virtue to master is accurate perception, correct expression, which is dealing with self-delusion, self-conceitedness, and self-inflation. So the reason we work on, so you work on a virtue for two to three months. I probably can't cover this in too much detail. It's connected to Samson in the Bible. 90 days, three months. Remember we talked about numerology, you know, doing something three times and four times and seven times and 12 times and 14 times and 21 times and right. There's something, there's something that clicks at that point at the three month mark. So you're just using spiritual principles to unlock certain doors to access energies and blessings that you would not be able to access otherwise. Chrissy says, so if you aren't aware, how do you work on it? Excellent question. You guys get that, right? That's the $64 million question. How do you know if you have negative pride? How do you know if you have self-delusion? How do you know if you are a raging a-hole or B? How do you know? Sitting down, being still, and looking at your life. That's how you know. How do you develop awareness? Through inner reflection. How do you have inner reflection? You sit down, you be still, you be aware and go, okay, where was I not loving and kind today? What was I lying to myself about? What does it mean to lie to myself? What does it feel like when I lie to myself? Give you an example. This comes with sensitivity which sensitivity is connected to awareness, also through purification. As you purify, your awareness increases, your sensitivity increases. So you might be saying, well, I don't know if I have self-delusion. I don't know if I have self-conceitedness. Okay, start working on it. And then guess what? As you start speaking to other people, and now that you have greater awareness, things are going to happen. You're gonna feel your energy go from here, right? And then you tell a lie, and then your energy contracts. And you're like, was I just lying to myself? Was I lying to that person? I think I was lying to that person. Aha. So you start developing awareness because you're more sensitive to your energy body. You're more sensitive to your spiritual cord. You guys recognize that your spiritual cord is constantly fluctuating, right? So when you're virtuous, the spiritual cord is big. When you're caught in a vice, I feel like that's the title of a song. When you're caught in a vice, the spiritual cord shrinks. So your connection to your higher self is minimized. But as you keep practicing awareness and you go, wait a minute, when I said that to that person, my energy shrunk, my energy contracted, huh? Wonder why. Or when you start lying to yourself, you start hearing voices. It's not that you're crazy. It's the whisper of the higher soul. You'll start noticing your energy is contracting or expanding. Right. Um, one way of validating a teacher is scanning their aura. Hey, does that person have a big aura or a teeny tiny aura? If their aura is expanded, that means they have a strong connection to their higher self. So character building in general, two to three months. We have five virtues and you work on each of those virtues 
for two to three months. You go, well, Christian, what if I don't master loving kindness and non-injury to oneself and others and thoughts, words, and actions within a three-month period? Does that mean what? You go on to the next virtue. No, but I want to master that. You're not going to master it in this lifetime. You're becoming masterful, but you're not going to master it. So you do one virtue of the five virtues, two to three months. Then you put it off to the side. Next virtue, two to three months. Put it off to the side. Next virtue. And then guess what? When you're done with the last virtue, you go back to the beginning and start practicing. See, Chrissy gets it. Then you start practicing that virtue. But now guess what? You've gone through, let's say a year, right? A, a little over a year of purification, purification, awareness, awareness, awareness. Then you go back to that first virtue and then you're going to go, whoa. And it opens up a whole other doorway. It's like you never even practice the virtue because you have that much of more understanding, awareness, purification. I'm telling you the virtues, studying the virtues, understanding, practicing the virtues is like gold. It's more important than meditation. I say that again, it's more important than meditation. Being a good person is more important than being a meditator only. Okay. Never forget that. In yoga, it's called the yamas and niyamas, character building, the yamas and niyamas, the doing and the not doing. Okay, uh, next question. Wesak, does a recording of a Wesak meditation have more energy than a recording of a regular meditation? Yes. No question. Like that's, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Your clothes that get blessed at Wesak have way more energy than clothes that get blessed at a Arhatic Yoga retreat. Flowers blessed at Wesak have more energy than flowers blessed at a retreat. Everything is amplified and magnified for Wesak. The energy is still pouring. You guys realize this, right? It's still flowing. It's still there. It'll be there for a few weeks. If you did the practice, if you participated in Wesak, the energy will be pouring for about a month or so, a little over a month. And then we have the full moon of Gemini coming up, right? The end of May, which is the second most powerful full moon of the entire year. Aries full moon cleanses the planet. Full moon of Taurus impregnates the planet with divine blessings in an eight minute period in one part of the planet, right? And then the full moon of Gemini distributes those blessings around the planet. That's why Geminis are what? Communicators. Distribu distributing knowledge. Distributing energy. Can you please explain the meaning and significance of the five-pointed star, the circle of nine used in the West Act meditation? Yes and no. Some of it's outside of my area of expertise. So some of you may remember the recording of Master Choa talking about um, the, the five-pointed star, um, the circle of seven, and then the, the half circle of nine. What's the purpose of that? Well, I want to make sure. Oh, I missed that question. Okay. Huh. Okay. So energy, energy comes down in spirals. That's how energy moves. Always. It doesn't move in a straight line. So energy comes down in spirals. So then when you have a certain container in a certain pattern, it determines how the energy is distributed. So to keep it simple, right? Because this is a little bit outside of my expertise about what you're asking. I understand what you're asking, but I'm thinking how I can say it clearly in, in, uh, in an understandable way. 
So at spiritual retreats, spiritual events, spiritual rituals, which is ray seven energy, the ray of magic, the ray of ritual, when energy comes down to a certain point, there's things that you can do with that energy. So the energy radiates outwards once it hits that point. So it's like, um, what do you call it? A, a lightning rod, right? A, it, it pulls down the electricity or pulls, it, it, it's like attracting, right? Hey, strike over here. So a spiritual teacher in the physical form is doing that. You have different levels of that truth. So when you have a retreat, you have the most advanced practitioner at the center, bringing that energy down because the teacher is a what? Energy transformer. So they, what does it mean to transform energy? It means to modify, modulate, qualify, quantify. It's changing the energy to make it absorbable for other people. So within pranic healing or hatha yoga, the most senior practitioners, keyword being practitioner, most senior practitioners are closest to the center of that energy. Then as the energy radiates outwards, relatively speaking, right? Outwards, it hits the next wave, who modulates and regulates the energy, who hits the next wave, and then hits the general public. You might be saying, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> I can almost see this. What could go wrong with the neophyte, meaning a new practitioner, sitting next to the, the teacher? Like if Master Choa was leading a West Sac festival, why does the newbie have to be all the way in the back? Why can't the newbie, right? They want to be closer to the action. Why can't they be right with the master? Because they're getting the direct blast. It's way too much. If you haven't been to a retreat like that, I've been to many Wessacks personally, like in a physical form. And trust me, it's not like this. Uh, it can be super overwhelming. You're like, but it's just energy. I don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. So that's why you have a, a tr um, and see, there's even more levels to it. The star, the five-pointed star represents the solar plexus chakra. It represents mercy. I'm sorry, represents, represents justice and severity. What is the pentagon? Aha, how many points does it have? When you see a sheriff, a sheriff star, what does that represent? How many points does it have? It's the solar plexus, severity and justice. So it's bringing the energy down. It's going through the sacred geometry and then it's going out to the other, the other transformers. So then when it makes it to the neophyte disciples, I, you wouldn't even really call them disciples, the neophyte practitioners, the new practitioners, it's regulated so they can withstand it. Best says, so it, so it helps distribute the energy and step it down as needed. Perfect. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Well said. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, is it important to plant the right seeds, but equally important to nurture those seeds? So it's kind of like, what's more important, the planting of the seed or the nurturing of the seed? It's obvious. Planting. Planting of the seed. So planting of the seed is what? Will. right? Will. So the man's semen, the man's sperm will. It's the seed. The woman is the love aspect, the yin, the form. So she nurtures that seed. But if a woman doesn't have a seed, she has nothing to nurture. So it's more important to plant the right seed than it is to nurture the seed, but it's a process of creation. They should be happening sequentially, right? It's not one or the other. 
Um, so keep in mind when you're purifying, this goes back to character building, right? What you're doing is becoming aware of your weeds, right? Your vices, your weaknesses, removing the weeds from your garden, then having awareness of what are the seeds you want to plant with your thoughts, your speech, and your actions. That's what you plant, and then that's what you will harvest. That's what the spiritual path is, removing as many weeds as you humanly can possibly do in one lifetime, planting as many good seeds in one lifetime as possible, and then repeating that cycle for eons of time, right? Until you've reached the liberation from the wheel of karma. So meaning you have no more weeds and there's no more need to plant seeds. You're now free from cause and effect because you are in alignment with the will of God and the will of the great ones. So that's what a holy master is. So everything they do is right action. It's in alignment with the divine plan. A saint is close, close, but not quite. Not quite. After planting, we need to nurture it or forget about it. Good question. Okay, so we planted the seed of love. Okay? So you planted the seed of love. You go up to a friend, a family member, and you say, I love you. I appreciate all the work that you do. Thank you for helping me out with that project. And then you never speak to them again. So you planted the seed of love in that relationship. Does that mean that you don't nurture that nourish that relationship anymore? No. Here's actually something that's really fascinating. We can kind of really get into the weeds with this one, no pun intended. When you say something loving to someone, look, everyone can validate this for themselves. It's a self-evident truth. Have you had somebody in your life when you were young who said something kind to you that you've never forgotten? Yes or no? Yes? Yeah? No? Um, oh, actually, okay. I think I know what you said, Christy. So have you had someone in your life, because this will make the point both ways, that has said something mean to you? Has it stayed with you for decades, yes or no? Where is that seed growing, in their aura or yours? Exactly. So when people say kind, loving things to you, it gets what? Lodged in your aura, and then what? fertilizes that seed. You ready? This is, this is high level. What fertilizes the seed is your energy body. That is amazing. Somebody says something mean, hurtful to you. These are called programs. I mean, we have good programs and not good programs, but in general, we say programs. So someone installs a program into your aura and they never have to say anything again. It's now in your aura, and if you're karmically entitled, and re realize entitled means good or bad, it, it just is what it is. You're entitled to have that happen. Your energy body is fertilizing that seed for the rest of your incarnation. So Avani's asking the question, well, if I plant something good, do I have to keep nourishing it? Well, it depends. Do you want that to grow faster and produce a greater harvest? Then you keep planting the similar seeds. I love you. You're beautiful. You're an intelligent person. You, um, you're kind to others. You're generous to others. Thank you for all the things that you do for me. I appreciate you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. And you just keep planting seeds in that person's aura and chakras, and then it they grow into better people. But if they plant programs of negativity, low self-esteem, low self-worth, you grow into that. So the athletes that I said something nice to, and they remind me of that statement every time I see my plan to put, ah, yes, perfect. So that's another principle of oneness. So Chrissy says something nice to her athletes and it makes them feel warm and fuzzy. 
and through the law of karma, through the principle of oneness, then they reciprocate. Hey, so isn't it interesting that they remember it, they keep fertilizing it, and then she gets the benefit of that over and over and over again. So she said it, she said it one time, quote unquote, one time, and then they keep reminding her. Remember, you plant one, one seed, you get 10 times or more back, right? So be careful what you plant. If I want something to materialize faster, I need to keep planting seeds and also have to nurture them. Yes, you need to remove the weeds, inhibiting the thing that you want to materialize. So that's connected to learning the lesson. So let's say you want to materialize better relationships, intimate relationships. So you have to stop planting the negative seeds of judgment and criticism and anger and resentment and jealousy and envy, right? Those are all seeds. So stop planting those seeds because those are getting in the way of what? The proper materialization of a beautiful, healthy, wholesome, harmonious relationship. So you stop planting the bad seeds. You remove the weeds, right? We know this through our Hatha Yoga and through Kriya Shakti. And then we plant the good seeds. And then we energize those seeds through blessing. So it's a four-step process. Remove the weeds stop planting the bad wheat, the bad seeds, plant the good seeds, energize the good seeds. Okay. Um, and we ran over. So I had one bonus. We'll have the bonus next week. Actually not next week because I'll be traveling and I'll be posting the older stuff. Ha ha ha. Jokes on you guys. Um, okay. So I hope that was helpful. Again, I'm going to remind you every single time we do these, these, uh, Q and A's tra uh, transformation Q and A Thursday. Hopefully I remember every time is how can I apply one principle today into my day-to-day -day life? One thing, right? Goes back to what Chrissy was talking about of awareness, awareness, awareness. How do I know if I'm an unpleasant person to be around? Well, sit down and go, am I a pleasant person to be around? If you say yes, right? If you go, yeah, I'm a pleasant person to be around. Where's your evidence? Right? Which requires you to be practicing what virtue? Oh, self-honesty. That's why it's the hardest virtue to develop. You're like, yeah, I'm super friendly. I smile at people all the time. What's your feedback from the world? What's the mirror, right? What's the mirror of your life? Well, people get all up in my face all the time and get me agitated. I get impatient, but that's, that's them, right? Exactly. They're the mirror for you, but you have to have self-honesty and go, you know what? I could be kinder. I could be friendlier. I could be more loving. Okay, fine. I forgive myself for being unkind, unloving, angry. I get it. I apologize. Forgive myself. Moving forward, what do I want to plant? Okay. Super, super, super important. So self-honesty, that's why it's recommended to practice removing negative pride daily through Kriya Shakti principles, through Arhatic Yoga principles, removing pride. You can also do it as, right? Psychotherapy book, create the whiteboard, put up all the negative pride, disintegrate it, cut, cut, cut. And then what does it look like to practice humility? What does it look like seeing things as they are? What does it look like acknowledging your strengths, acknowledging your weaknesses, right? And, that, and that's how you grow and evolve. But self-honesty is super important because if you lie to yourself, how can you ever see things clearly? Super important. That's why it's, you have to do it every single day because we're constantly lying to ourselves at varying degrees. And that keeps us stuck and prevents us from moving forward. I remember one time I said to one of my mentors, I said, I said, uh, <laughs> it's, it's got, it gave me that kind of like weird feeling going back to that energy. And I was like, um, I was like, I don't, I don't need a partner. I'm fine without a partner. I need a partner. And she goes, you're lying to yourself. And I go, you're right. <laughs> Because I was going through a lot of emotional pain around not having the right partner. So in order to protect my psyche, right? 
from that emotional pain, what did I do? Lie to myself. I don't need a partner. My solar plexus is like getting tight and closed up, right? Not true. So when you are honest with yourself, you can change, you can transform, you can become better. But when you lie to yourself, you just stay stuck. So that's something to work on every single day. That's something to work on every single day is pride, negative pride. You have good pride, healthy pride, and then you have negative pride. I'm not talking about healthy pride. Healthy pride is a person with good self-esteem, good self-respect, healthy boundaries, good self-worth, right? But most people have lots and lots of negative pride. You can find it on Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram. Is everyone following Indiana's TikTok? Okay, so you're adorable. So I hope I hope that helps. I hope you guys got something out of today and how you can apply it into your day to day life and transform and move forward. Let us close. Be aware of your heart. Be aware of your crown. Be aware of your heart and your crown together. To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, respected and beloved teacher, Grandmaster Cho Koksui, Lord Mahaguru Jameling, to Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, to Lord Ganesh, to Saraswati, to Holy Master Count Saint Germain, to all the Holy Gurus, Holy Masters, Saints, Archangels, Holy Angels, to the Angels of Awareness, Understanding, Inner Transformation, to the Angels of Self-Honesty and Honesty towards Others, to Accurate Perception and Correct Expression, to our Divine Selves, our Higher Souls, we thank you, thank you, thank you all for your great, great blessings. Thank you for your mercy and compassion. Thank you for your patience for us young souls in the process of growing and evolving and becoming better. Thank you for always being there for us. And thank you for blessing us with humility, giving us the ability to recognize our strengths and our weaknesses and to be good examples. We thank you, Lord God, we thank you all. With gratitude, respect, and the deepest of love, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. So be it. Thank you. So be it. So be it. So be it. That's mass. That was intense. Um, love you guys very much. I'm out of here Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Send me blessings. Um, and then I will be doing Sundays lecture meditation and healing from the hotel room so that's fine that'll be live and then probably next sunday we'll have a recorded meditation and healing um thanks beth appreciate you and i th think that's it um i want to recognize and apologize for not having the creative visualization recordings it's not that I'm lacking inspiration or ideas. It's um, a certain experience that I'm trying to give each person in the group listening to the recordings. And I haven't figured out how to make that happen the way that I intended. So I'm still working on it. It'll be part of the program. It'll be part of the membership. I haven't forgotten it. Trust me. Um, we'll get it out there. I just, I'm looking for something. There's something I'm not clear on. I probably have to talk to somebody about it. See, humility. I don't know. I don't know the answer on this one. I got to figure it out. Okay. Uh, may the angels protect you. So be it. I'm open to it. May they fly on each wing of the plane, underneath each wing of the plane. Um, and please keep doing what you're doing of emailing me your questions. It's um, either Facebook message me the questions, right? Facebook Messenger or send them to me in my email, christianrlong at gmail. Those, let's keep things simple. Let's keep things streamlined. Do it on those two platforms only. Try not to do it on WhatsApp. Try not to do it on my Facebook business page because the navigation is very, very difficult. It just is what it is. It's not, it's not, meant, for, it's not meant for business owners to keep in touch with people, their, their clients or patients or customers on Facebook. They just, it's not a good platform. But if you send me a message on Facebook Messenger or you email me, that's perfect, okay? And then we can add everyone's questions to the Thursday Q&As, okay? So lots of love to you guys. Be well, be prosperous, be healthy, happy, holy, and be transformed.
And I will talk to you on the Flippity McFlipperson. Bye-bye.